I'm Clay Aiken, and this is Politicon's How the Heck Are We Gonna Get Along? Joining us this week, author and humorist Joel Stein, comedian Jenna Friedman, Republican political consultant Rick Wilson, and new media pioneer and U.S. Air Force veteran Wayne Dupree. We have a illustrious panel with us this week. A great panel who um who have braved the coronavirus. It is uh, quite quite a bit different for us this week because uh, I flew in from North Carolina this morning mm -hmm. through Minneapolis. The airport quieter than it was a week before. Wayne um, came you... in from Atlanta, and um, the one of the workers said that uh, you know what. It's less people today than it was yesterday. So, you know, you can, I mean, and you could tell that a lot of people weren't, it wasn't robust. You didn't see a whole lot of people there. So, yeah, they're, they're starting to wonder and they're starting to freak out. A There's bit. concern for I sure. I came from uh, a half a mile away and I think <laughs> everyone here is an idiot. <laughs> really, truly. And this now half really a half a mile, stupid. a half a mile away in LA, typically would take you what thirty Took minutes, me seven hours. But it still <laughs> yeah, was man. really, really dumb to do this. Yeah, that's crazy. You had to eat traffic. a sherpa at the first landing stage. Yeah. Why do you think we were talking a little bit about this, uh, the audience and I, before a little bit about the coronavirus? Wayne and I talked. We talked a little bit about it. What do you think, Jenna? Why are people freaking out more about this than maybe other? H1N1 swine flu. Why do you think there's so, the NBA just canceled the season? Yeah. Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have it. I mean, Tom Hanks has coronavirus. I mean, that you're answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but why are people freaking out about something that's killing people? Um, I, yeah, I think it. I think it's it's more real than, um, and it's more. It's just more widespread than other infectious diseases that we've seen in the past decade. And then on top of that, uh, social media obviously plays a role in am oh, yeah. amplifying any information. The answer, Clay, is math. <laughs> yeah, you think, is it is it math? I mean, or is there a? Are we missing anything else that we've had in past well, the virus other, scares? The, the other thing we're missing right now is competent, calm, capable, transparent leadership at the top of the ticket. And if we had any other president in the last 50 years, I would feel a lot better if, because you know that Barack Obama or George Herbert Walker Bush or, or Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton or, or Ronald Reagan would not have gone out and said, hey, there's nothing to worry about, man, no big deal. It's gonna be gone in a week. We got a vaccine coming. They would not have gone out and lied. And unfortunately, Trump can't stop himself from doing those things. And so this corrosion of public confidence in what's going on leaves the, the, the or, or generates this giant like vacuum behind it. And everybody's scared as hell because, you know, they're seeing things on the news that don't sound at all like what the leadership in Washington is saying. But Rick, starting tonight, uh, Trump made a rule that you, have, you cannot fly to the U.S. from Europe although you can fly from the UK. So people are now going to be forced to transfer planes. Sure, of course, because here. what what could go wrong with having more people jammed into a disease-ridden tube? <laughs> um, the real thing, though, that I think you should have great confidence in tonight is the president announced he's putting Jared Kushner in charge of plague response. So basically, if you remember the opening scene of 28 Days Later... <laughs> Um, with the streets of London filled with trash. You're going to have that. If, if it's Jared in charge, it, it, we're, it just, the, the apocalypse is upon us. Wait, do you, think he's, do you think he's handling things better than you would have hoped or worse honestly, than you would have hoped? Or? Honestly, to tell you the truth, I disagree with, with Rick because I don't, we don't know what any other president would have done because this hasn't happened before like this. So... So we really don't know. We can guess. Well, Nixon and Nixon, Nixon and Ford know. Nixon and Ford, know. Both, Nixon and Ford both had had more, much more considered responses to swine flu in the seventies. I know that's a long time and for all of us. Even President Obama during the, Ebola, the Ebola epidemic, Ebola, yeah. he was really on it. I don't have to know what another president did. I know that this one told us not to worry about anything, and the stock market would be fine. And then went on TV tonight and said, "There's a panic, and I'm closing the airports." Like, it just, but you know what though? It, it just, I, any person can't shift one. that much in, okay. in but, one day. But, but it's, it's conflicting messages. But you also, but you also have to remember if he doesn't say anything at all. I mean, well, okay, fine. If he got up there and said, "Yeah, oh yeah," you know what? It's true. Oh, you're still gonna have massive panic. You're still gonna have. You have to have somebody. 
to at least say, listen, this is what's happening. Let's try to calm this thing down. And he has said that. Let's calm this thing down. Now, I'm not saying that everything that he has done is right. Okay. But he is, I mean, even what, what is the thing even that was right? I am not in the market. Well, actually, I am in the market. So I am looking at my thing on up and down, up and down. So I know that. Don't, uh, don't look tomorrow. Yeah, I know. But yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I try to take my stuff out, but it wouldn't. You know, whatever. <laughs> but <clears throat> it's, he's snake bitten is what, what in this situation, whatever he does, people are going to fuss. Is whatever he doesn't do, people are going to fuss. So, I mean, pick your, pick your poison, pick your poison, cherry pick, whatever you want to do. What is the thing he did right that you like? He tried to calm the whole situation yeah, I mean, to start off point, with. Does you Wayne have, have to do that. That most presidents do try, at the very least, we'll let you go, Joel. You most have to. presidents do try, at the very least, to calm the markets by allowing people to have some confidence that things aren't so bad that they need to sell all their stocks. I mean, is there not an argument for that sort of reassurance being necessary in a leader? No. This isn't about the markets. This is about people dying. This is about people shouldn't be gathering in large groups. This is about telling people basic science, and that is not what happens. If and the market crashes, okay. If the market crashes, what happens to you? are selling on the dips. I don't want to talk about the, the market with you. But if it happens, what happens? What happens when the market crashes? Yeah. I don't know. It happens like every 10 years. They, there's a recession and there's a recovery. I mean, I, not that things shouldn't be done, but I mean, when you're talking about a health crisis, the market's not your number one concern. But we haven't had these two happen at the same time like this either. Like this. On the have bright we? side. Have though. we? Yes? No? How did the markets do in 1918? Well, I was going to say, uh. yeah. On, I mean, the, the larger issue is everything we're talking about now is kind of moot because uh, fortunately coronavirus is not immune or is immune to fake news. So we'll yeah, it doesn't get follow to see Trump for on Twitter. ourselves <laughs> how bad but, but it really it's is. It's not really immune to fake news because if you tell people it's fine to gather in large groups, it will spike and the healthcare system and our other systems won't be able to handle it. No. So it, it, and we, there were a lot the of things. will do what it's going to do. There were a lot of virus will do very saying. different things if we if we, if we go to events like this that we shouldn't be at. But the early <laughs> the, the idea of early social distancing and as they say flattening the curve um, is something a lot of other countries are doing very aggressively. Whereas, you know, we spent two weeks where he said things like, it's just the flu, don't worry about it. We'll be down to zero cases in a few days. He said that from the White House. He said, we've got five cases, we'll be down to zero in a few days. That wasn't a good lie. Well, you, that the, was a bad lie. Okay, that was, ben, and that, that's, that, and when, and when people... When people cannot rely on him, and you know, I, I don't know if anybody's heard this, but Donald Trump has a reputation for not exactly hewing to the line of the absolute truth on the daily. Um, you mean like other presidents? There's no other, you know, Wayne, I'm, I'm kind of a historian of presidential elections and presidents. Mm. There has never been a president in our history of this country mm. with a level of mendacity to rival Donald Trump, not even in the ballpark of it. How did we get in Iraq again? Um, the fact that we went into Iraq, the, you, the fact that we went into Iraq, the fact that we went into Iraq, no, 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 no based no. on ba- wait, wait a second, Wayne. Based there wasn't a fault, fact that we went into based Iraq. On, it was a lie. Based it was on, a lie. Based on a piece of faulty intelligence is different. It was than a lie. President, it was a lie. Than a president, was it a lie? Than a president saying what twenty thousand, having twenty thousand lies in the first lie. three years of his administration. It was a lie, Wayne. Well, it was I, a I, piece I of. Stay, mis- I want to stay a little bit on coronavirus because we could certainly go into you know, things that happened 15, 20 years ago and talk about them forever. What would you have, what would you do differently, Jenna? Um, I think we should be listening to experts and like looking at other countries that have had the outbreak. Like it was really interesting to kind of see how South Korea responded versus how Italy is responding. And then the aftermath of their responses right at the beginning. Uh, There were issues with the coronavirus tests that set us back a little bit. And uh, Trump did not allocate money to infectious disease and pandemic response. Um, And so, you know, up until maybe really recently. And I think it's just about, you know, I'm a comedian. I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, But I do think. But you play one on TV. (laughs) But I play one on TV. But we are in a different moment to your defense. We're in a different moment now where because of the internet, there's a lot of misinformation and there's also a lot of information and there's a lot more transparency than there was during the Iraq war. And so people are able to see stuff on their own. Like you, a month month ago, you could see videos coming out of Wuhan Mm -hmm. where what the government was saying didn't match what people were showing you on video. And on top of that, there was also fake 
fake news. So I think I have a friend. He's an infectious disease specialist. He's on speed dial. I talk to him all the time, especially now. <laughs> and I think it's really important to listen to experts and talk to experts. And, you know, uh, I, most people who are in this room will most likely be okay, but it's vulnerable people, immunocompromised. It's elderly people who are going to really be in trouble. It's people who need to go to the hospital who are going to be in trouble. And I do think limiting social gatherings, maybe canceling some shows I have coming up, um, <laughs> is a correct response to what's going on. If we can't trust our leadership, we have to take it upon ourselves to try to... The, the leadership problem is also that we've just told every bad actor in the world that this is our government's response to bioterrorism. So if you want to attack mm. us with a bioterrorist attack, like, we, we don't have a plan. We don't have enough beds. We don't, we don't have any system in place. So... I, I just think this is a failure of our government. I know you don't. I know you don't want to talk about the economic stuff as much, Joel. But we have a question from the audience that I think is relevant because we're going to kind of flow into some of the political ramifications of this too. So, Mike. Well, one thing that just came to my mind as you all are up here talking is, I think one thing for me, and I think a lot of people subconsciously know this, that our president never takes accountability for anything. I think that that's kind of like the number one thing. It's like he never takes accountability for it, and it's like, okay, who who's going to actually take some accountability? Because I don't. I think it's harder to solve problems if you don't take responsibility and accountability for it. And I think he is focused a lot on other things, uh, like the tertiary things, like you know how the market's doing versus how people's health are doing, um, to a large degree. And I just read a story where. Um, uh, he's asking Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury guy, to try to get Jerome Powell out, or he doesn't like what Jer Jerome Powell is doing because he's not lowering the interest rates enough for his satisfaction. So, again, I think it's accountability, and I think it's – you don't really see any direct looking at the problem. It's, you know, looking at side issues a lot. So, so Jerome Powell's not lowering the interest rate as quickly as the president would like. Certainly he's, even, even to your argument, Wayne, he's doing some of these things that he's doing to hopefully stabilize the market. Mm -hmm. Now, we entered a bear market this week for the first yeah, time today, in, yeah. in yeah. 20 years, I think, or more. Um, so the economy's not responding the way Tomorrow's he seems to want it to respond. How is this going to affect him in this election year when he was running on the economy? You know, Going, going back to accountability, because I know when I do my show, um, the, the way that I call out the Obama administration is the same way that I call out the Trump administration, because you can't be seen as being stupid on, on not being fair down the middle. And I know that there was lack of accountability many times in the Obama administration, and I have seen President Trump... Um, not be accountable for a whole lot of things in this one too. When, but when we're talking about the experts, when I saw some experts, I mean, I hope they were experts that were sitting around that table last week. Men. I don't know if they were. <laughs> they were all men, which is, you know, a silver lining to all of this. They're going to be the first Were they go. experts? I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, if they were men, I mean, but were they experts in their field? I don't know. But, I mean, you know, they were talking about how long it would take for... Um, uh, Bring this plane in for a landing here you for know, me, the, Wayne. You know, the thing coming in. How is this going to affect his election this year? The economy not doing as as well clearly today and this week as he'd hope, and then I'll come to you, Rick. We talked about this, and I said, if he runs as an outsider, um, that they try to imp <laughs> that they that they try to imp that that they try to impeach him, he has a better chance of winning as running as an outsider. From the from the, the swamp, sitting president what from, running as an outsider, and it's never happened before. What? And they gave him that opening. I gotta yes. be frank with you though, because what I'm hearing is still not necessarily an answer to how's the economy going to affect him. Instead, we need to run as an outsider in, instead. So I'm going to throw it to Rick yep. because I want to get your response on on how that's going to help him or hurt him. Mm -hmm. Well, the fundamental predicate of Donald Trump's presidency has been but the market. The market's fine. Everything's good with the market. We looked away from the fact that the Federal Reserve has been juicing the market for 12 years now. And I disagreed with it when it was Bush, George W. Bush. 
I thought they were giving way too much of the of the market stimulus to the banks and Wall Street. I weird I'm a conservative, but I don't like crony capitalism. Those guys had had responsibility for the bad investment choices they made, but we bailed them out. And a lot of that bailout came from Federal Reserve spending. All through Obama, the Federal Reserve kept pumping liquidity into the system. All through Trump, they're pumping liquidity into the system. Well, we've reached the point where they're not where where the return on the on the liquidity juicing is now de minimis. There's very little impact. You know, the other day the Federal Reserve cut rates by by a quarter point, and the market did great for a few hours and Hour, dumped yeah. back out again. Yeah. So I think that there's going to be a much wider economic set of ramifications from this. It is going to put us into probably into at least a mild recession. Recessions are not good for presidents. And part of Trump's brand, and look, we did focus groups in 15 and 16 asking regular voters, like, why do you want to support Trump? And they were all like, he's a businessman. He knows how to make the economy run. He's a billionaire. You know, they didn't, they, they wouldn't listen to the fact that he was reading a teleprompter on a TV show. But they believe that. And now, you know, if the secret sauce of my 401k is doing great is no longer there, there will be political ramifications to it. Joe, you were nodding a lot. Yeah, as far as I was just thinking about Jerome Powell and lowering interest rates, and that that's the populist playbook. That's just mm-hmm. like, how can I have free money right now in the short term? But is there anything that he could do that would reassure people? If he brought more experts into the fold, if they started actually building facilities that were like, like there are, for example, like 3,000 fake abortion clinics in our country right now. They're called pregnancy crisis centers. They serve no medical purpose. Why not turn those into places where you can test people for coronavirus and treat people for coronavirus? That would be a really productive way to deal with fake abortion clinics. Thanks, a couple women and guys. Uh, Or just fine. Best Buy, uh, Barnes and Noble, shuttered retail stores. There's a lot of dead stores. malls out there. There are a lot of dead malls and places <laughs> that you could be like, you have these symptoms, go here so that you're not going to the hospitals and you're not getting people, like, you're not making people sick who we have work. to go to hospitals for other we reasons. We work. <laughs> we work is a great one. Nice. There are, what we do best is have, you know, shuttered retail facilities in our country right now. <laughs> and we don't really export much anymore. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to be creative and really tackle this, but we have to be um, facts forward and, and data driven and listen to our medical experts. Like Jared Kushner and Mike Pence. Will, yeah. Would the testing with the testing make things really better? Or yes. we or, know, or, we wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because if if the numbers spike, would that make? I mean, I mean, because you're saying that ignorance is bliss in this situation. No, if the numbers spike, it shows you actually what the fatality rate, which they're thinking is some in some countries, it's like three point four or something. Well, not really. They just suspended the whole season. It because they are being proactive. Because fifty thousand people in an arena. That's I'm not. I don't have a guy right now. Are they? Let me. It's the subject a little bit because I want to ask that question. Are there Republicans in the party right now in office that you agree with that you like? Or are Look, or, there, there are people who occasionally show a flash of independence, but the Republican Party that I knew, that I that I worked for for a long time, was about the Constitution, the rule of law, fiscal discipline, individual integrity and character. Those things are now very very absent in the party. It's been and taken, a small tent. It's been taken over and a small tent. Well, let him finish. Let him answer. I'm sorry. I, I was one of the guys that uh, was. Go on ahead. The, say it. No, I was one of the guys in this party that mm-hmm. went out into blue states and purple states and blue districts and purple districts and mm-hmm. elected Republicans. Oh, and you know what? Some of them were women. Some of them were minorities. And I'm sorry that 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 people like me warned the party that if you don't change course, like during the famous autopsy, if you don't change course and stop acting like assholes to African Americans and stop acting like assholes to Hispanics, you're going to lose their votes forever. Now, you know what's happened? We've lost 600 seats since Donald Trump got elected in part because those groups are now completely gone to the GOP. Are you still registered as a Republican? I just voted in the Republican primary in the state of Florida so I could vote against Donald Trump two times this year. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to re-register as an independent. I was waiting for that moment. See, the one thing, the one thing, um, because I'm sort of like a new con- conservative. Rep- I'm because I was a Democrat in 2007. I was a Hillary supporter until they decided to make everything that Hillary, Hillary and ben, um, Hillary and Bill say racist because they um, because of Barack Obama. But what I have, but what, what I have seen, and this is the, the this is the party that Rick was part of. 
and um, that is gone based on him is that uh, there was all there was a lot of individuals of color of minority that didn't that didn't seem welcome that didn't that that didn't feel as if they were part of or wanted to be part of the party so when when I say or, or, or when I hear Rick say well we need to go back there I don't I don't understand going back there because if you look at the party right now as 2020 and I'm going to rein it in as of 2020 there are no black people in Congress on the Republican side in the House in the House and only one in the Senate and the Republican Party has ha- has had a hard problem with that, and it didn't start with Trump. But it's I'm sure been, Charlottesville helped. It, no, 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 no. It's been like that for a long time too. Look, that was okay. that's the Democratic a, that's a Party long, was pretty racist. In that's the a long running. Too, you know? Look, Wayne, I don't disagree with you. That's been but a they also issue. welcomed a whole lot of people, women and minorities, in too. So I mean. Yes, I'm they not defending the Republican believe, Party. Right, I'm, right, just right, saying, right, I'm just saying everybody was racist and still is. And but uh, the, politics aside, that's something hopefully we can all agree on and change. Work on Keep things going, things. enemies. Well, talk over but you. with the Democrats, at least they had a plan. If the Republicans would have fought in the '60s and '70s for the votes, then we wouldn't see the split that it is right now. Well, you know, you go back to 1952, where Richard Nixon gave a speech about the urgency of desegregation in the country. Mm-hmm. There, were, there was a long arc in the party. You had, you had, you had Nixon um, telling the Klan to go fuck themselves. Yeah. You had Reagan telling the Klan to go fuck themselves. And Eisenhower. When I worked, when I worked for George w. H. W. George H. W. Bush, he sent guys like me down to Louisiana to run and to help the Democrat beat David Duke in 1991. This is a low so, bar. You know, yeah. Look, yeah. I know plan to go and I don't and, think I don't I don't want to be on a panel talking that. about how not racist the Republican Party is because right. that's not my that's expertise. That's your role right now. But I don't think. <laughs> but I don't think. I don't think. I don't think look, you planted your flag. <laughs> I don't think that. I don't think that you, Donald Trump's handling men. of Charlottesville. <laughs> White has, men. <laughs> I have noticed that. I'm um, also bald. I listen. I am. I selfishly am sort of. Enjoying the the little rift in the <laughs> Republican Party right now, but I want to shift gears real quickly and talk about the rift, or maybe not the rift that's in the Democratic Party that we saw this week um, with what do they call it? Big Tuesday, not Super, Super. Tuesday. Super Tuesday two. Um, we got another question from the audience. Introduce yourself and uh, and tell us your tell us give us the question you have for everybody. Uh, Patrick, um, given the recent consolidation before Super Tuesday to help propel. Uh, Biden's delegate lead. What other shifts in the state of play can be done to cement Biden's position? Uh, and then also, what more can Bernie do to stay relevant? Well, uh, he's done. Well, a- let's let's give a little background since I jumped right into that because I was yeah. really starting to worry about Wayne jumping across the table. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so I wanted to shift gears. But we obviously saw a big, ch- an, another big win for um ch- for Joe Biden yeah. on Tuesday night, Mississippi by a huge margin, Missouri, uh, Michigan. Mm-hmm. He won Idaho as well, mm-hmm. Washington. Eh, maybe it's tied. Uh, Still recount. It's, it's very so close. It, it's it's okay. mail ballot, so, so it takes a while. So there's I been went a, to so sleep. there's been a big there's been a big Big week for Biden. Two big weeks for Biden. Um, what? Where? Joe, let me go to you first with this. Where? Where does that leave us? Is is Bernie finished? Yes. Um, and and we don't need to talk about this anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, again fork. math. Well, listen. So, well, this is a question, a very important question that our audience, several members of the audience, had before we started, which is, what's next? Then Bernie gave a speech this week um, and did not. He gave a speech yeah, today. Yeah. We're obviously recording this on Wednesday, um, and and didn't drop out of the race. Yeah. But what was your impression of that speech, Joel? Um, I, you know, if you think about when Bernie, uh, I I interviewed him for Business Week four years ago. I spent a little time following around. If you think about why he entered the race four years ago, it was to get his message out. He didn't think he had a, a chance. He was That's a backbencher, you know, who wasn't even part of the party. And I think he still wants to get his message out. Out. So if he can go to a debate on Sunday and get a little more airtime for his beliefs, great. But I think he sees the math. I mean, I don't think he's in this to win it at this point. But then why not? So you, so you're saying you think that he's just doing it for 
the sake of getting his message across. But he certainly handled it differently today in his in his speech than yeah, he did he, he knows in it's 2016. Over. Yeah, well, it wasn't over in 2016 when he continued fighting, right? Yeah. But but what do we see in 2016? A lot of people. Again, another message that I got from quite a few members of the audience. You, why don't you introduce yourself and give us your question? Hi, I'm Shana. Um, so I've been seeing a lot of division between the Sanders and Biden supporters, particularly hmm. online. I'm not sure if that's reflective of reality or not. Um, sometimes it's not. But if Biden does continue his trajectory and wins the nomination, um, what can he do to win over particularly the Bernie or Bust folks um, to make sure that they actually show up and support him on Election Day? Well, I want to follow up the question that particularly for Rick, just because you, you know more about politics and the, the math of it. Is it important to win over the Bernie people, or is it more important to win over the um, the more independent voters in the Midwest and Florida? So, <clears throat> first off, Biden is, it's done. Biden's going to win Florida. That's the ball game. It's over. There is no mathematical scenario where Bernie magically gets, and, and especially because the superdelegate rules, which Bernie wanted mm -hmm. after 2016, make it impossible. It's done. He, Alexa, order a fork. Um, <laughs> Jenna's face right now is like, I'm the comedian. I'm the comedian on the panel. <laughs> this election is over in 35 states. It's done. I know how California is going to vote. I know how Mississippi is going to vote. I know how New York is going to vote. And I know how, how North Dakota is going to vote. Okay? 35 states, ball game's over. The idea that the Bernie coalition was going to turn out an enormous number of young people mm -hmm and an enormous number of Hispanic voters, and an enormous number of, of progressive working class voters has been disproven in every single race, including in the states Bernie won. Even in California, the majority of Bernie's vote was over 45 years old. There's a secret in politics. It's a really simple secret. Old people vote. Why, or why that you're going to say nobody likes women. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Because that's what you could, you know, deduce from the Hillary versus Bernie thing. It wasn't that people were afraid of socialism. They were just not into Hillary. Isn't it crazy about the, the, the nobody likes women where Elizabeth Warren drops out, but you still have Tulsi Gabbard in, but the media... Doesn't don't say, say her name two more times. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. I, she could appear. Keep going. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to still, cut you off. She don't is even, still don't in the race. Don't even invoke it. It's anyway, not. That's not. She's still so in the race. Here's, here's the even. thing. Here are the two. Here are the two things about whether you got to win the Bernie voters back. If Donald fucking Trump isn't enough to turn you out in 2016 or 2020, no matter who the who the Democrat nominee is, then you're not a Democrat. You're not a progressive. You're a fucking anarchist. You don't care about anything except watching the fire rise. The second thing is, in those states that are up for grabs in the Electoral College, which is the only game in town, you know, Hillary Clinton won three million more votes. You know what? That and five dollars gets you a latte, okay? <laughs> There's nothing about the popular vote that matters. The Electoral College is all that matters. So if you don't go out and win Florida, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Arizona, Virginia, North Carolina, states like that, that are purple on a good day and red most of the time, those states are not woke. Those states are not hotbeds of progressivism. There is no like army of progressives hiding in the cornfields of Wisconsin ready to come out for, for Bernie to march the aristocrats to the, to the guillotine. It doesn't exist. It's, those states are moderate states. So you got to have somebody that can turn those people out and you got to get back those Obama Trump voters. Those guys were union members. They were white male union members in the, North, in the northern tier industrial states. So Jenna, I want to get Jenna in because yeah. Jenna, do you, did, you had an answer to her question in general. How do people, how does, how does Biden appeal to Bernie voters. I get the sense that maybe people, some people on the panel don't think that matters. Um, if no. it matters, no, if you think it matters, or if not, A, does it? And and B, do you want to answer her question? That I way? mean, I think Biden's campaign strategy is to should be to just not talk. <laughs> and you're I not, think... You're not even wrong. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. And I think in terms of, I think that has to come from the top, from Bernie. I think... Bernie's base follows him. It's a personality cult. And he's done a lot of really great things pushing pushing, uh, <laughs> pushing our country. Really? <laughs> you guys 
current, I can't say pussy. All right. So he's done really great things pushing our country. He's got to, a little E next to our podcast. <laughs> to the left. But if you look at like the thing, you would think that there would be less divide between his base and Warren's base, given that they have such similar platforms. And that became so acrimonious. And so I don't think that it's Biden's responsibility, or I don't even know if he'd be able to get Bernie's base on board. I think that has to come from Bernie. I think that has to come from progressives. And you are seeing uh, female progressives who were stumping for Bernie saying how they will vote for Biden in the general. AOC just said that. Linda uh, Sarsour just said that. Um, you know, the, the, that message is kind of slowly trickling out, but I also think a lot of his diehards will vote for him even after he's dead. Like, there will be a, hor a hologram <laughs> Bernie running in 20, you know, 28 or whatever. I don't, I'm not, can't do the math. Um, that it's they Joel's will category. <laughs> will vote for, but I'm just saying I think it, it can't it can't come from Biden, and I don't know if Biden is capable of anything other than shutting the fuck up and beating Trump and not letting other people talk for him. Not a fan of Biden, or I'm not not a fan of Biden, but I'm that's, not. That's his slogan. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm I'll fine. do. <laughs> I'm a fan of Elizabeth Warren. I am a fan of the progressive uh, movement that is slowly <laughs> infiltrating, you know, the, the rest of the Democratic Party. Um, I. I will excitedly vote for Biden against Trump, um, but I also see the need for, you know, acting really quickly on climate change, universal health care, all the things that the more progressive branch of the Democratic Party is trying to push for. Okay, well then, and well, I think he might get me too, which is fine. He's not as bad as Trump. But you, I mean, what, it, it seemed like there was some consensus on the panel, at least, that there's no need to appeal to the Bernie audience when yeah. it comes to for Biden to be able to win. I'm just saying it's not so, from Biden. It should people will need to appeal to them, but it won't be him. It will be it will be people that they talk to and that they trust. But Joel, you seem to think there's not and I and I correct me if I'm mis, misinterpreting what you said. It sounds like Rick and Joel, you don't think it's necessary. I don't either. So well, it, if, it's not if, necessary. It helps. Biden I mean, waste, it, did Bernie waste his time then? What's the point in getting the message out did, if no one's going to listen Ber to Bernie it? Bernie is a classic singing to the choir guy. He is, I mean, the people that love Bernie live in states that are already going to vote Democratic. I, Massachusetts is going to go Democratic no matter what. New York, California, Oregon, Washington, a handful of other states. Those he won places, North Dakota. Those places, but it's a Democratic primary with like eight people. Um, <laughs> but in, in places, an election that's as close as last time, like in Wisconsin, right. you, you really you can't game, afford anything. It's a game of small numbers. Yeah. And, and again... Look, I've done a lot of work in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. Those states, Republicans stole seats from Democrats in those states for 20 years because you know what we did? We went out and talked to Democratic union members who were, who were dudes. I thought you were going to say gerrymandering. We went out. <laughs> How's that working in a statewide? I'm just meaning in general, stealing, but keep going. Well... Now, you, do I mean, I your, now do California and Maryland and others and New York and show me the German. Both sides of, play that game. Speaking of preaching to the choir, I mean, I'm, I'm especially North, Maryland. I'm a North Carolina voter. You don't have to convince me to to believe you've been you. Through, you've been to, to that rodeo. You when it when you make that argument that yeah. those states are important. What I'm asking though is if. Biden is able to win this election without paying attention to Bernie's voters and courting them now. Did Bernie waste his time in trying to get that message across? Here's the thing. Bernie's voters didn't vote. Ding, ding, he, ding. Correct. He can, he can fill up these arenas. I mean, you think it's the second and the third coming of Cocoon, uh, you know, for the, you know, the, the thing. <laughs> But when, but everybody when everybody has gotten a laugh now tonight, <laughs> everyone, congratulations. But when you see, I mean, but when it's time to vote, all those people, he should have been able to rat, I mean, like run circles around Biden with all those people. And it's like they went there to have a great carnival time. Yeah, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. And then they sat at home. And now Bernie's like, well, uh, it's revol revolution. So, Jen, are you ever going to get this climate change action that you want, Joel, or these prog progressive... I, I don't think well, Bernie wastes his time. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, he I was... didn't. I, I mean, think of it in the last... Uh, uh, quickly, in the last four years, where he's moved this conversation, the things he's introduced, the, 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 just the whole idea... With, and whether, other people, too, like right. Warren. And yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but, but yeah. again, starting four years ago, these weren't... We weren't talking about... That's the truth. Debt Hillary forgiveness for college. Healthcare. We weren't talking about universal health care. <laughs> like, he was an ignored backbencher who changed the conversation. So, I... He's, it's a movement. He didn't change, he waste his time. Yeah, no, I was going to just do a little callback to coronavirus as we talk about who votes. 
<laughs> do you think that that's going to change anything in terms of who's going out to the polls if we have a pandemic that's disproportionately striking older people? Until November? Through November, you think? Well, remember the Spanish November? flu in 1918 went away. I don't went remember away in this, that personally. <laughs> well, I am just about that old. No, um, the uh, in, in 1918 the Spanish flu faded away in the springtime and came back in the fall with a vengeance. Um, now that doesn't mean this is necessarily going to repeat that pattern, but it has been known to happen. Um, I will tell you this: anybody who thinks that 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 the Trump team and the Republicans are not going to go out and do a massive vote by mail absentee ballot program to old voters who are going to be scared of going out to the polls is out of their mind. They will do that. The Democrats had better be up on their game. And I'm on sure that the front. Democrats will do the same. So, yeah, thing. they better be up on their game if they want to But just, you know what? My my thing with Joe Biden, if Joe Biden because last year I was saying Biden was going to be the nominee. People were like, no, no, no. Biden's going to be the nominee. Biden was the only candidate up there that could win the black vote. Well, whether you've seen that. whether you believe it or not, weeks. he was the only one that they listened to, the only one that they really uh, trusted, whatnot. But now, if Biden wants to win, and I and I'm a conservative, and I, and and I, and I said I would never ever vote Democrat again. But if Biden wants to win, Biden's going to get a female mm -hmm. minority vice presidential candidate. And put her on stage with Barack Obama when they go through those states. Mm -hmm. If they do that, Trump's going to have a hard time no matter what the economy or whatnot is. Because once you see Biden and um, Obama back on stage again, that's going to, uh, 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 you know, kind of sh shake back. up the base. Yeah. And, if, and if you have that minority woman, female, it doesn't have to be black. It could be Latino. It could be Asian. Whatever. But if you have that in there. Very open. Well, yeah. yeah, Joel, you your response in general to the VP. We're, since we're going down the VP path, since you seem to we seem to have determined that we've got a nominee now, Joel, do you want to respond to his? Well, I, I do, but I also have a question: Do people vote on the VP, or is it completely irrelevant? They will with that one. Well, Tim Kaine. That was my. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you know, know that T-shirt. I still remember that. The thing about it's... Tim Kaine was the smoldering sensuality of Tim Kaine. <laughs> I wanted a, a male president, and so <laughs> a male vice. I wanted a male vice president, and so I was like Tim Kaine. Vice presidents traditionally do not do as much as as people think they do right. for tickets. They don't really provide. You know that the old idea of oh, we've got to have so and so to win the South, and this guy will balance the regional balance. You know. Uh, that spell was broken when Bill Clinton, mm. a guy from Arkansas named Al Gore, a guy nominally from Tennessee, as his same DP. age, or something. Uh, like. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so they didn't. So that idea that you needed somebody um, who was either was either regionally or 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 politically balancing, I think, is over. I do think Wayne's right. Joe Biden will would would strongly benefit. He's already proven he can turn out the African American vote in yep. very significant numbers. Yep. I think he would definitely benefit from a female uh, VP candidate or a fe or, or an African American VP candidate or 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 you know or both would probably be a very powerful message. Yep. Just uh, spitballing. What would happen if he picked like uh, Stanley McChrystal? What if he went the other way? Picked like a, a white male general. How does that affect like the Midwest and Florida? And well, that that and you look at some of the target states. Florida and Arizona are two of the biggest v veterans populations in the country, and a guy like McChrystal has a degree of foreign policy and military gravitas that is definitely missing in the Trump era um, from from senior ranks. Now that Jim Mattis has fled the fled the scene, can he survive any potential backlash from? His own party, if he doesn't, choose, if he doesn't balance the ticket with some sort of diversity, though. Once again, they're running against the VP. Will be running against Mike Pence, the whitest yeah. human being in the universe. <laughs> Assuming he doesn't get blamed for coronavirus <laughs> and get kicked off the ticket, and we uh, like to end the episode with a little segment we call "Pull the Plug," where we ask everyone on our panel to tell us something about something that they are currently working on or pitching, um, and. In exchange for doing that, they have to pitch something of someone else's, something that they like right now in uh, popular culture. It can be in politics, it can be a book, or whatever. So, uh, Rick, you are on the edge of your seat. I'll start with you. I'm going to shamelessly pitch my own book, Running Against the Devil, a New York Times bestseller, but what the hell? It's, and, and very it's a highly reviewed 
thank you, sir. It's a guidebook to, to beating the sky. It's some very tough love. Uh, and the thing I want to pitch from the outside is the Center for Disease Control's coronavirus website, which is actually very, very chock full of reasonable things to keep yourself safe in this particular moment we're in. Um, cool. Uh, I'm going to pitch uh, none of my upcoming live dates because save yourself, but um, <laughs> they're another, I'm not even going to tell you about them, but I do have a show on Adult Swim called Soft Focus. Uh, we're shooting another one soon, maybe, or maybe not, who knows, we're all going to die. And then I want to just give a shout out to two things. One, my favorite infectious disease specialist, his name is Dr. Amish Adalja, and he works at Johns Hopkins and he's just brilliant. And then Sarah Kenzior is a really brilliant um, expert on authoritarianism. She's been who I've, she and my friend Andrea Chalupa have a podcast called Gaslight Nation and Sarah has a book coming out and I... It's called, I haven't read it yet, clearly it hasn't, it's not out yet, but it's called Hiding in Plain Sight, and they're just, they've been such a breath of fresh air during this slip into fascism. So the podcast is Gaslit, Gaslit Nation. Um, I'm going to plug my own book, right? Please, is that what yes, you do? No, All right. It's called In Defense of Elitism, Why I'm Better Than You and You're Better Than Someone Who Hasn't <laughs> Bought This Book. Um, and, and I'll plug. And John, but 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 you went and lived. You stayed in in Texas. What was the name of the? Town I did. I went to Miami, Texas, which had the. It's in the county, uh, Roberts County, Texas, which had the highest percentage of Trump voters in the country. And, and you I, spent how long there? I was there for a week. Um, <laughs> About all you could handle. No, I would have liked to stay for more. They were really cool, uh, really nice, and I learned uh, a lot from them. And uh, I thought I would just learn things from them that I could like stitch on a doily and put in my kitchen, uh, <laughs> and I would teach them about the world. But it didn't quite work out that way. Okay, so that's your book. And that's then my book. I'll pitch, uh, I'll plug uh, Rick's book. Well, th- well that you, was yeah. very gracious of you. <laughs> okay, Wayne. I like to plug the United States military. and uh, Wait, that's why I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> AIDS, AIDS babies. AIDS babies? Is it too late for AIDS babies? Damn it. <laughs> on, on my way over here, because I served in uh, Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield, at, during my fight and wait. You know, but um, yeah, uh, uh, there was a guy that was sat right next to me that served over in the same area that I did, and we've just talked about that area. So I want to give a shout out to uh, all of the military branches and all of the job that they're doing. And um, and I'll also pitch in real quick if you want great ribs, ri- um, t- t- great take, ribs, take off the back. Put your seasoning on there. Wrap it in parchment. You're from Maryland. We keep wrap it in barbecue. parchment paper, <laughs> right? Really tight. Then wrap it with um, aluminum foil. Put it in the oven three, 300, 300 degrees for three hours. Take it out. Put some barbecue sauce this is on your it. Recipe. You this got is it. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. I don't know if I'm going to take that barbecue cooking will unite us all. Food, from food, I don't think I can food that. Food brings all of us yes. together. That's true. Oh, yeah. That yeah. answers the question. That's true. And then your show. And well, well, you know, I plug that. And but to plug some others, I to plug something else. I want to plug CNBC. Yes, I do. And tell us why. I want to plug CNBC because I've been able to watch them and their finance and what they've been doing over the last couple of weeks with this whole mess. And they are the they are more non political and more into telling people what is going on with their money. And if you want to see somebody that is telling the truth about what's going on with these businesses, CNBC is doing it. Forget everything else, Fox, Autumn, CNBC is really on point with that. That was Ron and Santa's rib recipe. (laughs) (laughs) I I wasn't going to call you out on that, but... You know, Jim Cramer's fried chicken is delicious. <laughs> I will um I will I will plug this podcast, which we are now in the second week of, and I have to say, this was my favorite episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't seriously mean that. Next week um we have uh we have the majority report Sam Cedar, uh Breitbart Joel Pollock, um mm. gun rights activist Antonia Okafor, and Congressman Ted Lou will be with us next week also. And we hope we will all be able to be in the room together. Um, Joel probably won't be joining us. Cancel it now. (laughs) Joel Stein, Wayne Dupree, Jenna Friedman, and Rick Wilson. Thank you guys so much. We'll, uh, We'll see you next week.
follow at Politicon on all social media and go to Politicon.com for information on how to reserve your seat to see how the heck live. If you've got a question for us on Politicon's How the Heck Are We Gonna Get Along, come to a show. Or if you can't make it, email us at podcast at politicon.com. Subscribe to Politicon's How the Heck Are We Gonna Get Along on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. 